Rahubat, everybody. This is I am Hotep Jed, George Smith, uh, representing Goldemore Services. Um, found another article, kind of, kind of lengthy, but uh, I think I'm gonna go through it all because it's pretty important. Let me cut off that commercial. Yeah, I think it's pretty important. Uh, it's the child support system in uh, in Texas and. Um, I forgot the the judge's name is David Hanshin. Uh and he's a, a magistrate judge, a family court judge. Um and he is a judge, he's a magistrate judge. Um and he's talking about the unfair practices and child support going on in the state of Texas. So, so I don't know why that little commercial keeps coming back. Let's see something. Okay. All right, so I'm just going to read through this, uh, give a little commentary, all right? All right, here we go. The problem began the night his wife didn't come home. He had left his construction job, then fed their kids. He put them to bed, watched TV, and tried to sleep. Often his wife worked past midnight at an Arlington restaurant, but it was 4 a.m., and she was still gone. After a few hours passed, finally she called. She'd been out with friends. Could he pick her up? Antonio grew suspicious. Had she been with another man? No, of course not, she told him. But in his mind, it was the first crack in a marriage that continued to crumble. Financial stress compounded their problems, causing terrible fights. The conflict reached a fever pitch in 2005. He left and moved in with his mother. Shortly after that, he got a phone call from a relative of his wife's. Your youngest daughter? He told Antonio, she isn't yours. She belongs to another man. Antonio refused to believe it. But after his mother heard similar rumors, even she began talking about how the little girl didn't look like their side of the family. Over the next 18 months, Antonio tried to visit his children, but his wife wouldn't allow it. There were more fights. His wife claimed he hit her and slammed her against a car, which he denied. Now, let me stop there. Because I, I was helping one guy and he said his wife, his or ex-wife said he used to beat her up and stuff. And there was no evidence of that. So a lot of these women are going to these courts and crying to these judges saying that dudes hit them. And the judges are just taking it hearsay. They're like, oh, okay, cool. We're going to award you the kid. But that's a violation of due process, even in family court. You're supposed to have due process everywhere you go. So... If the judge is taking, making decisions off a of hearsay with no evidence, that's a procedural error and uh, that it needs to be appealed. Or it's a willful error, but you got to bring it to their attention that, you know, they could lose immunity, uh, you know, if you disagree with how they're, uh, uh, how they use their discretion. So she moved and he couldn't find her. Then last summer, Shortly before his wife filed for divorce, Antonio received a letter from the Texas Attorney General's office, the state agency charged with enforcing child support <coughs> obligations. The letter instructed him to go to, to a Dallas County child support court where in August 2007, he faced making monthly payments equal to 30% of his take home pay, which is around $1,500. Antonio, not his real name, requested DNA testing. If what his relatives said was true, he argued, why should he have to pay, why should he have to support a child who wasn't biologically his? He would later learn that under Texas law, a man is presumed to be the legal father of any child born during his marriage or to the child's mother. And if he questions his paternity, he only has four years to challenge it. All of Antonio's children were older than four by the time he and his wife went to court. All right, so we all know that, yeah, you can request DNA, but just because the kid is biologically yours doesn't mean it's legally yours. <laughs> and those are two different things that the, that the courts want you to believe is the same thing, but it's not because the words are right and exact. Right. And I'll just keep reading. I think everybody listening to me should know that already. 
What happened next focused attention on the growing availability of DNA testing and caused the legal uproar that, ratchet, that ricocheted uh, from the halls of the Dallas County Family Courts to Austin headquarters of the Republican Attorney General Greg Abbott. On January 14th, Family Court Judge David Hashin ordered Antonio and both of his daughters, five and seven, to undergo paternity tested, testing immediately. The next day, lawyers within the Attorney General's office who represent the state on behalf of the mother and children asked the Fifth Court of Appeals in Dallas for an emergency order, which is an injunction. They should have called that an injunction, halting the testing. These lawyers cited the four-year statute of limitations and argued that because Antonio was already the legal father, right? Legal father. And that's a per. it was all of a presumption. You know what I'm saying? So he should have went in there saying, I'm not the legal father. He had no grounds to request DNA testing and dispute that he was the biological father. The court of appeals agreed and ordered that no testing be conducted, but it was too late. On January 16th, the lab re released the results, which placed the probability of Antonio fathering either of the girls at 0%. So it wasn't his. On January 25th, Appeals Court Justice Carolyn Wright ordered that the test results be sealed and kept from the children. <laughs> That's sad. This is why you never put your life in the hands of the court. This is, this is, it's embarrassing. Hold on, hold on. let me interject here. It's embarrassing for a man and a woman to go to court to to divvy up the estate, the joint estate between them both. It's embarrassing. You can't even handle your own affairs. You're like infants. An infant trying to raise infants. It, it just doesn't make sense. You know, these, these people weren't raised right. You know what I'm saying? And any woman who goes to a court to beg the government, a.k.a. their father, uh to give them some uh, allowances because that's basically what this is that's embarrassing you don't want to date a woman like that stay away from them to, for those women stay away from them because that that'll make no sense that'll make no sense at all no sense at all bro that's that's sad that's sad you're asking another man to rule on your life uh like he's god so anyway this was followed in March by the court's written opinion that slapped Hashin for ordering the testing in the first place and ordered the DNA results destroyed. So that don't sound like a good law to me. That sounds in it like an immoral law. And the justice, Carolyn Wright, I know she's following the statute to the letter. I get that. But, you know, that's not her problem, y'all. She's just to uh, adjudicate and interpret law. You know, she this is not political for her. So she's technically following the letter of the statute. It's up to the people to get the legislator to change the law or vote their ass out of office and get somebody in there who will. You know what I'm saying? Or form your own organizations, man. All right. Okay, so I read that part and ordered and they ordered the testing kept from the children <laughs> come on man why would you keep that type of that's that and that's just immoral how, how could you keep the results from the children now that i will knock her for because that's just immoral that's the actions of a demon okay hanshin hanshin how do you pronounce this dude i think it's hanshin hanshin refuses to comment on specific cases but says that in certain situations a court's denial of dna testing may violate a father's constitutional right to equal protection and the legal system itself may be condoning fraud now this is a judge saying this in my court the truth does not have a statute of limitations he says good job hashin good job man at least somebody got some morals in family court. You guys aren't all gargoyles and demons. Okay, it's just the truth. And if we have the means to know the truth, we should. Now, what did Yeshua say? You shall know the truth and it shall set you free. Not that I have faith in the truth or I believe the truth. He said, you shall know the truth. All right. 
All right, let's keep going. DNA testing has garnered widespread attention for freeing the innocent. Yet the growing avail availability of biological testing in paternity cases complicates efforts to balance the rights of fathers with their interests of children. Okay, all right, so you're talking about rights. Rights only created by contract, not constitutional rights as men. And interests, that should, that's a contract word. That's a commercial word, interests of children. So that lets you know it's a contract, right? who could be emotionally damaged by losing a father figure simply because he doesn't share their DNA. Right. Part of the problem, Hashin says, is science has gotten so ahead of the law that the law hasn't been able to catch up. Hashin, a tall bearded man with a sober demeanor and a deep bar baritone voice, has stood out as a maverick at the courthouse since he was elected in 2006 as one of more than 40 Democrats who swept the Dallas County Judicial Contest contest in a partisan sea change. He wears his hair in a ponytail that hangs down to his lower back and has been mocked by conservatives, such as a former state Republican Party chair, Tom Pelkin, for being a new age judge who chomps on weird nuts and seeds and has lawyers sit under a Buddha, which is prominently placed in his conference room. Hashem calls the criticism scurrilous because I have a Buddha I bought in Thailand five years ago. They think I'm offering some kind of cult in here. He says, come on, it's an amazing piece of art. Aesthetics aside, through a year's worth of un unorthodox moves regarding the way Texas enforces child support laws, the judge now finds himself in the battle against the largest law enforcement agency in the state. In February 2007, he complained that the Attorney General's office was deceptively asking men to sign away valuable rights when they first appeared in child support court. And last summer, he declared that the, office, the office's process for notifying presumed fathers of their court dates violated due process. So this is actually a good judge here. You know what I'm saying? He's calling out the Office of Child Support. Not too many judges going to do that. His recent authorization of paternity testing may have been the last straw for the office. Emails viewed by the Dallas Observer and interviews with assistant attorneys general reflect that in early February of this year, 2007, supervising attorneys within the office, the office's child support division launched a concerted campaign to collect affidavits from nearly a dozen staff lawyers, in some cases exerting pressure on them with the apparent goal of filing a complaint alleging judicial misconduct against Hashin and possibly fellow family court judge Lynn Sherry. She, decide, she sides with Hashin on many of these issues. Whatever the motivation of the Attorney General's office, its response to challenges from these Dallas judges seem heavy handed. It's very rare, says University of Texas School of Law professor Jack Sampson, who co-wrote the Texas Family Code. The way you're supposed to correct judges' errors is by appealing, not by attacking the judge directly. But there is much at stake for the Attorney General's office, a powerful state bureaucracy accustomed to getting its way. The office touts its dogged pursuit of deadbeat dads and casts itself as an advocate for children. The office's child support division is a prized component of Attorney General Abbott's administration. The office has been nationally recognized for leading the country in child support collections with a record of 2.3 billion for its 2007 fiscal year. Since his election in 2002, Abbott has made child support a major focus of his office and used it as a rallying cry in his 2006 re-election campaign. Wow, they re-elected this guy? Wow. Okay. See, that's y'all fault. Y'all y'all re-elected him. You re-elected him to extort you. <laughs> okay. But to critics, the office's unwillingness to acknowledge that some of its practices may railroad poor, uneducated men into financial hardship is evidence of more sinister motives. The office receives federal funds based in part on the amount of child support that it collects and distributes giving the child support 
division a budgetary incentive to close as many cases as it can, no matter whose rights it may it might trample. Hashin has also drawn criticism with some observers saying he sets himself above the law and legislates from the bench, but his supporters counter that he's merely shedding light on the problematic problems that govern the messy, the messy matters of sex, fidelity, and truth in paternity matters. In fact, lawmakers and fathers' rights at advocate, uh, activists have been lobbying across the state and, and the country for changes to a body of laws that are crucial for assisting women and children, but can also saddle the wrong men with onerous child support obligations, seized assets, and even jail time. See, that's all by operation of law if you don't show up to court, you know, to, to rebut everything. You know what I'm saying? They, 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 they're acting like it's a contract, but it's not. They try to put liens on your house, your car, you know, garnishments and all that stuff, man. Uh, but they can't do it, so you make sure you sue them. It was Tuesday morning in late January. A dozen women sat on benches on the third floor of the George Allen Sr. Courts Building, which houses Dallas County's Title IV D Courts, where assistant attorneys general champion the child support rights of low-income moms. Okay, we know that there's no such thing as child support rights. Those rights are created through contract, right? If you don't contract with them, uh, they don't get no rights <laughs> or they can, they can get the welfare, but then the welfare can't collect it from you, which is title four a, you know, and TANF funds and all that. We all know, um, I don't even know the column, uh, you know, somebody talks about that. He's very good at talking about title four a and title four D. Okay. So let's keep going. Some of the women held swaddled infants. Others chased after toddlers who skipped down the hallway laughing, blissfully ignorant of the proceedings that brought their mothers there. While a few sullen men talked on their cell phones in low voices, a middle-aged black woman complained to a young mother, I don't understand why they have you come here and sit so someone can mediate. We can mediate just fine, she said, shaking her head about the errant father who wasn't supporting his kids. It's ju it just adds up and up and up. So I actually, the first dude and the only dude that at this point that got off child support, um, he had a mediation, <laughs> he had a mediation y'all where they tried to give him and his baby mother different documents. They were going back and forth cause they had him in separate rooms saying, oh yeah, he said this. And then going back to him and saying, oh, she said this, but they didn't even say that they just making up stuff. They're so corrupted. I'm telling you, these people are corrupted to the core, man. They corrupted to the core, man. And, um, you know, that, that case got dismissed. So anyway, inside one of the three packed title four D courtrooms with the, with its, um, vol, how come I can't pronounce it? Vol, volume, voluminous, voluminous child support docket associate judge sean finn scolded a tall blonde man in a suit who had consistently missed his payments you need to understand that you need to pay your child support each and every month not just before you come to court the judge said loudly his face stern <laughs> the man nodded she's losing time off her job to come down here and get money from you that you're not paying and I don't want to bring her down here again. There are the types of scenes most people think of when they hear the word child support or deadbeat dads. Frustrated single mothers who turn to the state for help as they struggle to care for their children while thwarted by men who skip town. Won't work or simply refuse to pay. Hashin, who as a judge has sent dozens of deadbeat dads to jail is more than a little familiar with such problems. It's just that other problems seem to be largely ignored. The vast majority of the work the attorney general does is necessary. It's providing legal services to poor people and we need to have child support, he says. 
there are, however, some huge holes that have been created by these laws. Uh, I don't think we need to have child support. I think people just need to learn how to stop living like monkeys. <laughs> stop having babies, including myself. Uh, stop having babies with women who just are not worthy. Or strapping on the condom tight and stop trying to turn a slut into a housewife, basically. Shit, I'm just going to come out and say it. All right. So on a March afternoon in the chambers of his 254th court, Hashin wears his trademark gray hair pulled back in a long braid. His intense blue eyes and gray beard make him look like a bit like a like a bookish Gandalf the Gray. Speaking slowly and methodically, he lays out his concerns about the laws governing the presumption of paternity, especially the four year statute of limitations. I'm not out to destroy anything. I just want the right dad paying child support or going to jail for not paying. And the only way they could legally throw you in jail for child support is if you sign that contract. See, he's talking about step step four. Like, you sign the contract, you start paying, then you stop paying. No. Anytime you have to pay or anything like that, it, it's a contract. They're holding you to a contract. All right. So, but I'm talking about step one, step one, you wouldn't even have to worry about the statute of limitations. Wouldn't have to worry about paying child support or going to jail. If you did go to jail, you can go to federal court and sue them because there's no contract and that's in us versus let go. So, all right. So kids keep going 12 years ago when in private practice, Hashin represented the client who came to him after a girlfriend he hadn't seen in a decade showed up with a 10 year old and announced it was his. The man, a barber in Oak Cliff, took the woman at her word and signed an acknowledgement of paternity. The legal document that makes a man the legal father until he, the child reaches 18. We already know that, that that's your death sentence right here. You never sign this, ever. Yeah, I, I don't care. Don't ever sign this because that that now you're legally responsible for taking care of the baby. Don't you ever sign this. Ever. Don't ever watch one of my videos and then sign this and try to call me and be like, I can't help you because you're stupid. You're dumb for signing that. You're dumb. I'm going to tell you as as an expert, you're dumb. Okay. The man later became suspicious and got a DNA test that showed he wasn't the father. Hmm. She wouldn't lie, would she? <laughs> but it was too late. They hit him with a $32,000 in back child support. H Hashin says he lost his business and went underground, just like uh, Mr. Osiris went underground after he lost his uh, child support case. <laughs> Sorry, I had to throw that in. Okay, so he's not the only one who went underground, stopped using Social Security card and all that. Other people have too. As a judge, Hashin's first problem with the practices of the Attorney General's Child Support Division occurred in February 2007, shortly after he had taken the bench because he knew he would be hearing many appeals from Title IV-D courts. He decided to learn how things were being done there. He noticed that when a man arrived, an, assert, an assistant Attorney General would ask him if he had a lawyer. If he said no, as most did, the attorney simply told him to sign in. Hashin glanced at the signed papers and discovered that the forms were actually appearance sheets. After the lines for name, address, and phone number, a paragraph at the end stated, I wish to avail myself of the jurisdiction of this court and hereby make my appearances in this case for all purposes. You just gave him jurisdiction here. You just, you just gave him jurisdiction to judge in personam jurisdiction too. So anything you ever receive in court, read it. And if they're saying, oh, don't worry that you say, uh, uh, hold on player, I'm reading every word of this because that's how they like to play games. And this is a, a county appeal, you know, cause the administrative court is even below the state district court. So I know in San Diego, you can appeal to the county court from an administrative court before you even get to the state appellant court. So, all right, let's just keep reading here. Where was I? 
as most did. Oh, yeah. By signing it, Hashin says the men were giving up their right to challenge the court's jurisdiction over them. All right. So I don't know. Some people out there talking about, oh, don't talk about jurisdiction. It's not going to help you. OK, a judge just said it right here. It will help you. So let's not be stupid. All right. After discussing his concerns with several judges and lawyers, he directed the Title IV D judges as well as the assistant attorneys general in each of the child support courts to stop using the forms or to remove the last paragraph and signature line. The attorney general staffers in one court only stopped after a conversation that Hashin describes as forceful. Jerry Strickland, the attorney general's communication director, confirms that these forms are no longer used in Dallas County, but defends their use elsewhere in the state. They allowed our staff to note who appeared in court on a given day, Strickland says. They had no legal effect on the Right. These people, just, they just accustomed. So if a judge who knows the law way better than Jerry Strickland does, way better than Jerry Strickland does, says they had no legal effect, I'm going to take the judge's word for it. I am. And plus, he's shown to, to do good deeds. Hashin has. Of course, Jerry Strickland don't like it because they're losing money and they're losing time because they can't expedite the cases like they want to. So they quickly want you to give up your rights because they know without you doing that, they have no power, y'all. They got no power. So uh, let's keep going here. Sorry, my uh, this website it's slow. It never loads all the way. So it's kind of slow. So please be patient with me. But to Hashin, there could have been adverse effects. If no one explained to them their rights and what the form meant, he wonders, what else wasn't being explained? Hmm. UT's Samson doesn't take as dire a view of the apparent sheets as Hashin, noting that the men had already received notice and could request DNA testing, but he agreed that the process can be inequitable. It's kind of unfair to get someone to sign something they don't understand, which is failure to disclose. All right, in any contract, failure to disclose, um, which, which the contract can be revoked because it's like fraud, right? Failure to disclose is basically equal to fraud. Some of them can't read, they're poor, so their chances of understanding everything they sign is the same as you understanding everything on an insurance policy. And the worst thing here is it's for 18 years. Indeed, once unmarried men sign an acknowledgement of paternity, either in the hospital when the child is born or afterward in the Title IV D courts, contesting paternity with or without DNA proof can be a daunting task. If a man goes out and gets DNA testing that says it's not his child, but it's after four years, he's screwed, says the local assistant attorney general who asked not to be named. Huh. Because he's a punk. You've got 17-year-old kids signing these things and they don't even know what they're doing. When hospital staffers ask fathers to sign the form, the, DNA, the paperwork cites DNA testing as an option, but young, unwed fathers are unlikely to request it in front of the mother and her family. Yeah, that would be kind of awkward, right? I had a recent case where both parents were 16, the attorney says. Both families are there. When is he supposed to say, I want DNA? He'd be accusing her of sleeping with someone else. It's important for children to have fathers, the lawyer adds, but now you've just allowed a mother to name whoever she wants to name. And if the guy is gullible or ignorant enough to sign, he's stuck. Exactly. Exactly. Hashin's second problem with the child support division procedures arose last summer when he heard about a case in which a man ordered to pay child support said he hadn't gotten the notice of the proceedings against him. Okay, I know that happened with me. By law, the Attorney General's office may notify presumed fathers of these proceedings with a first class letter instead of personal service by a constable, deputy sheriff, or a process server, which is not served. I don't care, under federal law, that ain't serving nobody. I don't care what they state law says. 
they that that ain't serving nobody first class mail that that doesn't count if the man doesn't get the letter for example if his address has changed and he fails to show up to court a default judgment is entered because that's operation of law something has to happen right you get a court date you don't make it a default order is basically a product of operation of law a default judgment is entered against him and he can no longer contest paternity or the amount of child support these letters, Hashin says, are not adequate notice. The family code laws are in conflict. One says you have to be served by a process server with instructions to let you know this is serious stuff, as opposed to a one-page letter that says, come down and talk, he maintains. To give people proper due process rights, you have to give them proper notice. Right, so they're playing games. They're playing games, man. Just like corporations play games, child support is a company. Struck Strickland, however, says uh, child support division does in fact serve most preserve, presumed fathers by a constable or sheriff, but men often dodge service. Okay, that's that's what we can do. Obviously, there are non-custodial parents who are not living up to their to their responsibility. He says, uh, "Well, that's not up for you to decide. That's between the man and his creator, not child support." Okay. Yet Hashin isn't the only judge who has problems with the division's efforts to notify presumed fathers. Family court judge Tana Callahan, who also came to the bench in a Democratic sweep, s says she's had several child support cases with the attorney general's office in which inadequate notice has come up. It's a problem, she says. The presumption is they get the letter, but sometimes they don't. And next thing they know, they're getting child support taken out of their paychecks. Whether whether men feel wrong by inadequate notice, misguided legal principles, or dishonest mothers, those who find themselves paying for child support who aren't theirs can turn to an advocacy organization that fight what they call paternity fraud. Carnell Smith, founder and an executive director of Georgia-based U.S. Citizens Against Paternity Fraud, organized the group after discovering that a child he'd supposedly, supposedly fathered with a former girlfriend and supported to the tune of $40,000 over 11 years wasn't actually his. The United States Supreme Court declined to hear the case, but Smith finally was relieved of the financial burden by legislation, which he has successfully spearheaded in several states, including Georgia, that allows men to use DNA tests to disprove previously acknowledged paternity and that's what i'm talking about y'all y'all need to start forming organizations right and i'm not talking about uh the league of dads that he can't do nothing for you <laughs> you know i'm not on really anybody's side i just call out i guess bullshit when i see it yeah he really don't know the law he can't do nothing for you you know uh so i would just try someone else um hold up boy this thing is going so slow so that's what i'm saying if this guy can do it probably just a regular old dude you know what i'm saying but he had the heart to fight his stuff and get them to change the state legislation in three states y'all so it could be done smith says thousands of men across the country have contacted him since he started the group in 2001 but he also hears from women mostly the wives of men wrongly paying child support Dallas resident Belinda Odom Gaston founded Texas Families Against Paternity Fraud after a lengthy legal battle to free her husband of financial responsibility for a child he didn't father. He had signed a paternity of acknowledgement. Oh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. An acknowledgement of paternity after a woman with whom he'd had an affair claimed he fathered her son. So that's what I'm talking about living like a monkey. He, he messed up. Right, he cheated on his wife, but his wife loved him enough to fight his child support case with him. You know what I'm saying? So he got a good woman, and he just messed up. She must love him to, to I mean, <laughs> to take that action. You know, you know, she took an exigent action to stop the payments. You know what I'm saying? But he messed up because he let this the woman he had an affair with um game him into signing an acknowledgement of paternity 
You know, you got to tell her, you know, love ain't got nothing to do with it, baby. This is some legal stuff right here. Love ain't got nothing to do with this paperwork right here. And if you can't talk to your woman or whatever and make her understand that, she ain't your woman, dog. <laughs> she ain't your woman. Need to find a new girl. All right. All right. Let's keep going. Odom Gaston received a statement showing that the attorney general's office was seizing their joint tax refund to pay child support. So they took money from her, too, which is messed up. Her first indication that her husband had engaged in an affair and fathered the child. Oh, my God. So she didn't even know, y'all. She only found out at the, <laughs> that the attorney general said, yeah, we got to take your joint refund and apply it to child support. And when she didn't even know what was going on. So she confronted her husband, who had little contact with the child, and convinced him to get DNA testing. After the test results revealed her husband was not the biological father, Odom Gaston hired a private investigator to track down the real father and confirm his paternity. Okay, so not only. So this woman knew that this dude had money, right? Because if she and she and he signed. You guys got to be smarter than this. Got to be smarter than this, man. Stop signing that damn paperwork. To stop signing it she cheated with the girl first of all he cheated so it was kind of his fault kind of it was his fault he cheated on a good woman it seemed like and then the woman who he cheated with his wife told him to get um a dna test and the dna test found out he wasn't even a father so his life is kind of in shambles. Hopefully he's doing a little better these days. And she must have asked a little bit of money too because she hired a private investigator to track that down. So she was on it. She was on it, y'all. She was on it. Okay, here we go. I was devastated by the affair, but I was more devastated by how my husband was played. Didn't I just say he was played? Odom Gaston says, I can't do anything about what two consenting adults did, but I am damn sure can do something to protect the estate I've worked to accumulate. You, if you guys following me should know what an estate is. If you don't, then look it up. Though the attorney general's office fought review of the case, the couple hired an attorney. They were relieved of the child support obligation, winning a $4,000 judgment, judgment against the mother because she lied. You know what I'm saying? And <clears throat> that, that, brings up a segue into something else if if the baby is yours y'all if it's your child your flesh and blood uh, flesh and blood progeny and the baby's mother is is denying your parental rights to see your child you can sue her y'all you can sue y'all you can sue you can sue because i because in a couple months I'm going to do it myself and I'm going to do it for another client of mine. You can sue. And there's certain case laws that have set up parental rights for parents. You know what I'm saying? I think I went over that in another video, but um, yeah, I may make a video about that. So anyway, to such entanglement, Smith proposes that paternity testing be required before presumed fathers sign anything. Opponents say it would reduce fatherhood to biology alone and ruin family stability by allowing men who have already established fatherly relationships with children to disappear f from their lives, which is false, right? Because if the mother will allow the father to be there, if, even though he may not be the biological father, he may still want to be there, right? And so to f f this argument by Smith saying they would reduce fire i mean fatherhood to biology alone that's just not based off any facts it's, he's just saying it so he must be in favor of child support you know what i'm saying he must be in favor of it because that's his point of view which is it is incorrect thinking so but to Hashin and fellow family court judges sherry and callahan the so-called family integrity protected by current law is often non-existent 
and that goes along with I, with what I just said. What kind of integrity does this family have when someone is perpetrating a fraud against someone else? Callahan said, the law doesn't seem to care. Sherry agrees, saying more access to paternity testing will cut down on fraud and give judges more discretion to determine what's best for families on a case-by-case -case basis. Now, now that should bother you. Give judges give judges more discretion to determine what's best for families how does a judge know what's best for your family unless you just proven to not be responsible for nothing you know what i'm saying like you just you going in there like uncivilized um acting like a fool in your life and in front of the judge you know what i'm saying that's and then the judge is like, well, you look like you can't even take care of yourself, so I have to take care of you. <laughs> I'm, I'm offended by that. You know what I'm saying? I'm offended by that. You may have a father who says, I don't care if he's not mine. He's my baby, she says. But if there's a question, especially when there's misrepresentation and fraud, to slam the door shut on paternity testing is an injustice. I think the child has an an innate right to know who his biological parents are, Hashin says, pointing out the importance of genetic testing for health reasons, such as identifying hereditary diseases. Part of the family code is that the child's interest overrides everything. I can't figure out how it's in the child's interest to lie to him about who his parents are. Jack W. Marr, president of the family law foundation which lobbies lawmakers on family law issues says presumptive fatherhood bears a re-examination by texas legislature in a one-year period between 2005 and 2006 he says at least eight cases in which presumed fathers turned out not to be biological fathers were sent to appeals courts statewide hashin points out that since most of the division's cases involve indigent men who can't afford a lawyer much less an appeal the number of contested cases is, is likely much higher that tells me that in texas there's a serious problem that needs to be addressed Marr says we're trying to solve it recent legislative attempts that have been unsuccessful but the house committee on juvenile justice and family issues is slated to address the problem uh, in next legislative session in the 2007 session, Houston State Representative Harold Dutton Jr. wrote a bill that would have made DNA testing available to men in divorce cases, ordered non-biological fathers to pay no more than $100 per month and allowed them to maintain relationships with children without necessarily being financially responsible for them. The bill died in the state Senate. I mean, that would have been, that would have been cool, you know, for people who don't know better and have already in the system, you know, that would have been some relief for them. But of course, the state Congress shot it down because they would probably lose money, right? So for now, Mars says his group has agreed to wait on the sticky wicket of married men and focus his efforts in the next session on resolving the notice issue by requiring personal service of process. The whole thing is based on expediency for attorney general's office they don't want to serve people personally mar says we're going to address situations where there are defaults and allow these people to come in and get dna testing the way antonio found about his wife's child support claim was fairly haphazard uh, he was digging through a pile of mail at his mother's house last august when he found a letter from the office of the attorney general's child support division it instructed him to appear in court the following week. He was surprised and angry because his wife hadn't let him see the children in nearly two years, he says. He tried visiting them in school, but they were in class. So he left $2,000 with the administrator to give to them. That's a nice thing to do, you know? After all this time not knowing about the kids, she files for child support. He says, I was upset. On August 30th, he appeared in Title IV D court, and after Antonio raised the question of paternity, Judge Finn ordered DNA testing. The Attorney General's office appealed the order, <clears throat> which would become relevant again when Antonio's wife 
filed for divorce in September. Her attorney declined to comment because the case is still ongoing. Antonio hired his own attorney, Kathy Emin Clardy, and on January 14th, they appeared before Hessian on the issue of DNA testing. Hammond Clardy figured that they had a decent chance of winning. She'd been involved in a similar case where Hessian ordered DNA testing for a divorcing father who had a relationship with his presumed children. Hessian didn't disappoint. It is clearly in the child's best interest to know who their father is, he announced from the bench. It is clearly in the state's best interest to know who the father is so the correct person can be paying child support. Testing ordered immediately. See, they don't care who the father is. They just want to get the dude with the most money, right? They just want the legal father to pay. And like I said, the legal father is not the biological father. But the kid does deserve to know who the father is. I, I agree with that. You know, because some of these women out here, they, they're kind of crazy. All right. In an interview, Hashin would argue that current law doesn't give fathers equal protection and requires that a court enforce a lie when the truth is just a lab test away. I'm bound to uphold the laws of Texas unless I find them to be unconstitutional. Um, so this guy, the judge, feels that the law is unconstitutional. That's why he's not enforcing it, right? He's not enforcing it because it's unconstitutional. But usually a, a magistrate judge does have um, discretion to say whether a law is constitutional or not. But usually that you have to take that to the appellant, whether state or federal, to say, hey, this is unconstitutional. The whole law is unconstitutional. But he, this guy, I mean, he knows the Constitution and he said, no, I'm not going to enforce this because I know this is against the Constitution. No law repugnant to the Constitution can pass. People get all upset about the term activist judges. We're not making up laws here. We're saying there's a problem. We need the appellant system to sort it out for us. See, the appellant, usually take it to the appellant. UT Sampson's says the appellant courts have spoken to the issue and have consistently upheld the four-year limitation and that is precisely what the fifth court of, of appeals did on january 16th when not two days after hessian's rule justin justice wright stayed his order for testing then after 10 days later after the appeals court learned that the dna test had already been conducted conducted the appeals court ordered the results sealed on March 12th, the panel of justices agreed with Attorney General's position that Hashin had gone too far by ordering the testing. Although the judge's position is that there should be no statute of limitations on the truth, which is fraud, basically they're saying there's no statute of limitations on fraud, which is true. Once you discover the fraud, you can always go back and revoke it. All right. And it's in its best interest of the children to know who their father is, wrote Justice Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Although the judge's position is that there should be no the truth and it's in the best interest of the children, wrote Justice Douglas S. Lang. Such determinations are a matter for the legislature, not the trial court. Um, I kind of agree and disagree with what this justice is saying. Um, if you know that a law straight up just goes against the Constitution, I think the judge does have the power to act. You know what I'm saying? Um, even though this justice agrees with Hashin, they're saying it's a it's a matter of legislation. So they've got to rewrite the laws or clarify the laws or change or just get rid of the law because it goes against the Constitution. But I think the judge is using proper discretion, right, based on what he knows. Hashin counters that if a trial court fails to make a declaration, about a law's shortcomings there's no way for a higher court to review it okay that's a technical thing hashin might find himself in a position to review the issue if it comes up in a subsequent case he is running for a seat on the all republican fifth court of appeals in the november election yeah i hope he makes it too uh one dallas family lawyer finds hessian's actions Regal and ego-driven, which which it's not. 
while maintaining that most lawyers who have considered the subject feel the four-year statute and limitations is bad law. But it is the law, and Hashin is saying, I don't like it, so I'm just not going to follow it, the lawyer says. He set himself up above the law. See, that's and that's what I'm talking about. Lawyers aren't that smart, y'all. And let me let's break down this paragraph. Lawyers aren't that smart. Okay. I don't know how long this guy's been in business making money, but he says he says first of all that Hashin's actions are ego driven while maintaining that most lawyers consider that the law is bad. The statute of limitations law is bad. But the four year statute of limitations law cannot apply to cases of fraud and non disclosure. Right? Because the 14th Amendment says you got to have due process. Due process includes disclosure. That's where it all comes from. So if you're saying that the four year statute of limitations applies to DNA testing, but if you want to get DNA testing because you were defrauded, then a state that that statute of limitations don't apply, right? Because you went against the con the Constitution, right? So that law doesn't apply. So you could pretty much throw that out, and that's exactly what Hashin did. You know what I'm saying? So let's keep going. Whether Hashin is a principal jurist or a rogue judge. Uh, he is drawing attention to a controversial idea of law that impacts millions nationwide. You've got a judge sitting up there saying, hey, there's something wrong here, says Marr of the Family Law Foundation. It highlights the seriousness of the issue. And the problem isn't going to go away just because there's presently a gotcha clause in the law. All right. In mid-February, uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. In mid-February, rumors began spreading in the courthouse that the Attorney General's office had it out for a couple of uh, state district judges. Hashin heard the higher-ups within the Child Support Division had begun collecting affidavits about him. So did Judge Sherry, which who had also clashed with the Attorney General's office over child support issues. Several AG employees told me they felt uncomfortable because the people at the regional office were asking them for negative information about me and some of the other district judges sherry recalls i thought it was bizarre behavior from a government agency on february 1st supervisors within the division had begun asking staff attorneys if they'd ever heard the two judges make derogatory comments about the office one assistant attorney general who requested and amenity recalls telling supervisors about an occasion when Hashin had derided the office. The judge has referred to supervising attorneys within the division as black booted government thugs and shits. Hashin admits that he can be quite blunt at times. Most of the attorneys who were asked to submit complaints about Hashin and Sherry assume their bosses. Um, assume their bosses were planning to hold a meeting with the judges but later emails from james jones a senior regional attorney supervising the dallas child support division suggested the attorney general's office might be planning to file a complaint against these judges with the state commission on judicial conduct in a february 4th email jones wrote i want to thank everyone who responded to my request concerning judge hashin and judge sherry i will respond individually to everyone who submitted an incident a certain assistant attorney general will then prepare an affidavit affidavit for you to sign we want to expedite this in an effort to get all the efforts all the affidavits to austin by thursday we need your responses to my individual emails asap and I, I'm telling them affidavits are strong, man. Even child support trying to use affidavits to get try to get rid of two judges because they don't they don't like it. You know, they used to get in their way and they don't like it. <laughs> you know, so and those are testimonies within the affidavits, which I, you know how I feel about that. That's strong. That's strong stuff. It's pertinent. All right. To some staffers, this was a red flag. When I hear affidavit in austin i think um my bad uh da, 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 da. oh yeah to some staffers this was a red flag 
when I hear affidavit in Austin, I think you're trying to file a judicial misconduct c complaint on someone, says one assistant attorney general, filing a judicial misconduct charge against a judge if they haven't done anything. If they haven't done anything, you'd be blackballed. If you get fired, where, where are you going to go? Many of the division attorneys in Dallas who were contacted agreed to sign affidavits, but several refused. On February 7th, Jones sent his email. Some of you have indicated your concern as to what will happen if a complaint is filed with the SCJC and that it will be uncomfortable and unpleasant appearing in the 254th Family District Court after Judge Hashin is aware of your complaint. We must protect our AAGs and a motion to recuse is absolute nece necess necessity. Okay, so there you, the, the Office of Child Support is trying to use a motion to recuse because uh, he has some kind of conflict of interest in making a right decision in the case if people sign these affidavits against him and he knows about it. Same thing in a child support case. If a judge is sitting in on the child support case, the judge cannot be there. Under uh, ju Judicial Conduct Canons Law 3, the judge cannot be there because he has a financial incentive in the case, he or she. You, you got to ask, you got to put in a motion to recuse them from, from the case. All right. A recusal would mean an, an attempt to have Hashin and Sherry removed from thousands of cases. Again, I appreciate very much the courage it took for each of you to step forward, Jones concluded. On February 8th, an assistant attorney who declined to speak with the observer refused to complain about the judges. At this time, he wrote in a group email, he wrote in a group email, I do not want to participate in any activity regarding Judge Hashin except regular court matters. Hey, baby. <laughs> Jones replied, detail for me why you feel you have the right to disregard Article 8.03 Bravo of the Texas Disciplinary Rules of Professional Conduct. The ethics rule requires lawyers to report instances of judicial misconduct. But the assistant countered, I took your initial request of us to mean that you were interested in things that Judge Hashin and Judge Sherry have done, which we felt were inappropriate. This has now escalated to the point where you wish me to claim professional misconduct against a district judge. If I am to risk myself and my reputation, I certainly want to make sure I have the grounds to do so. Although the attorney wrote that he did not agree with some of Hashin's methods or motives, he felt they did not raise a substantial question as to the judge's fitness for office. Jones declined to comment for the story, referring all questions to the attorney general's, uh, attorney general's press office. Strickland, the communications director, summarized the office's position in a written statement. Attorneys in our Dallas area offices expressed serious concerns about certain judges' courtroom conduct and perceived bias against child support division and the child support collection process, he wrote, because the conduct posed a potential threat to the children. Not a, It's not a threat against, to, against the children. It's a threat against the, child, the Office of Child Support, who depend upon this office for child support for information to saw, uh, for, for information was sought about certain judges' alleged misconduct. Uh, the objective was an informal gathering of voluntary factual statements from concerned staff attorneys. But the relentless matter of, in which superiors uh, went about gathering these affidavits raises, raises questions about how voluntary they truly are. Strickland even acknowledges that staff attorneys have raised questions about statement collection process and said the division is conducting a review. As for potential complaints against the judges, he says the jury's still out. No final decision has yet been made as whether the underlying complaints warrant filing a complaint with the Commission on Judicial Conduct. To Antonio, who is now 30, the legal and political clashes between the two governmental bodies are meaningless. The important thing for him is to somehow sort out what to do about his broken family and get on with his life. He wants the lawsuits to be over, but with the recent Court of Appeals decision, 
and the fact that settling his divorce would mean accepting legal paternity for all three children, there's no end in sight. On a recent afternoon, he sits in his lawyer's office and talks about the three children he once thought were his. He says he misses taking them to the park and hearing them call him dad. The girls were just toddlers when he left, and even though he wasn't much of a girly guy, he misses playing dolls with the older one. When he was granted rights to see them early this year, his lawyer advised him against visiting the girls if he was going to contest paternity. It might reestablish their bond and hurt his case. It was a tough decision, but his bitterness at his wife's betrayal and the financial hardship of supporting two non-biological children swayed him. He would only see his son. In January, father and son were reunited at Chuck E. Cheese. It was awkward at first, but after a few rounds of skee-ball, the eight-year-old loosened up and seemed to have fun. <laughs> Sound like skeet ball. <laughs> they, <laughs> all right, let me keep going. They see each other every weekend now, visiting Antonio's mother and going to the movies. The boy's seven-year-old sister, meanwhile, is heartbroken. She hasn't, she ha she doesn't understand why the man she remembers as her father visits visits her brother, but not her. During a recent visit with his son, Antonio called his estranged wife to say he would be late dropping the boy off and she told him the girl had been crying all day. Her mother put her on the phone. She wanted me to buy her a toy, pick her up. Antonio says he his face sombered and, res and resigned. I told her not right now. For now, Antonio hopes that one day the hearings and the waiting and the legal fees will come to an end. And as he strives to return to some semblance of normal life, he tries to remember the truth and not to think about the little girl's tears and wonder how things might have been different.